we're definitely past uh, one. I think we're like, yeah, 104 now. <laughs> that clock is almost right. I always try to make sure I know what time the, the clock actually says um, so that I <laughs> try to finish on time. But this is Operating Systems, and I wanted to welcome you all. This is a challenging class. You know this is a 12-unit uh, class, and it will... Um, that usually works out to be the right amount of units. <laughs> um, in some cases it doesn't, but uh, we'll give it a go. Anyway, uh, this is an introduction to Operating System Implementation. It does have a hard prereq of CS24. Um, if you have not taken CS24, then I'm going to tell you that what I usually do is ask the registrar, hey, who hasn't taken CS24? And then we um, unfortunately drop them from the class. Um, just because there is so much important material in 24 that this class really needs. And uh, I'm also thrilled that we actually have a <laughs> class that CS24 is a prereq for now. We didn't used to. So yes? What about graduate students? Graduate students, I tend to be more lenient. Um, but also, I can just speak from experience. I'm not saying this necessarily reflects this class, but I've seen grad students make bad decisions. So, um, you know, just weigh carefully whether or not it's a good choice based on your background and training. Is it, is it okay just to audit CS24 so we can focus on the website? I, the like I said, you can try. We can discuss this uh, after class if you would like. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen double E's go for it. Some have done great, some have not. So, but we should definitely talk about that afterward if you have any concerns. Um, project class. I love project classes, because, mainly because it means no exams. Uh, I hate exams. I know you all hate exams. But um, basically, all the assignments are programming assignments, starting with the one that will go out by Wednesday. So most of the programming is in C. A small amount is in assembly code. I mentioned this in my course preview that I sent out to the CS undergrads. Um, there's a little bit, like in, in the second assignment, I want you to get experience with the bootloading process. So I'll make you write a little tiny bit of a bootloader so that you can see what that's like. Um, Typically, it's one person in the team who either loves that or draw, draws the short straw ends up writing that part. Everything else, if you understand what the processor does, then you're pretty good. You don't have to worry about um, being able to dash out hundreds of lines of assembly code, uh, bug free or anything like that. Also, we use Git. Um, hopefully, you all have experience with Git. If not, this is great because a lot of people use Git or other similar version control systems by now, so you'll get a lot of experience with that. Uh, starting in assignment three, you'll do pretty much all of your assignments in this operating system implementation called Pintos. Okay, Pintos was written by uh, some people at Stanford. It was actually a, a project that sprung out of another project called Nachos. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's a very simple Unix-like operating system. You, you don't even get a terminal. Basically, the way that you run programs in it is very limited. Most of the time, it'll actually be through the tests, the unit tests, the, the uh, tests that are required to pass for each assignment. So don't get any brilliant ideas like, oh, I'm going to be running Xterm and be able to remote connect to other computers and things like that from Pintos. No, it's really simple. And you'll be happy that it is when you get there. OK, let's see. What else? Um, oh, yeah, I will be gone for part of the second week and the third week, just FYI. We have lecture recordings for those things. Um, as I said in 121, what usually happens when I disappear is people discover they don't need me, and that's fine. Um, what uh, we'll be able to do during those weeks is use the lecture recordings, and we'll have TAs by then, um, hopefully more than one, hopefully more than two, and uh, they'll be able to help for those weeks. And then, um, who here's used Piazza? Anybody here use Piazza? Okay, so I usually set up a Piazza for this class because there's always little weird things that one team runs into and another team has already encountered and figured out. And it's really great to get that synergy between teams. Um, obviously, since this is about the sixth time, maybe the fifth time I've taught this class, I've also seen a lot of the things people run into. So I'll be able to help on the piazza and so forth. So we'll, we'll uh, cross those bridges. I'm not really worried about it. It always seems to work out. Books, okay, <laughs> completely optional books. I already told you about this, so I don't feel like I have to talk about it too much, but there's uh, the Operating System Concepts book. Um, I'll be honest, I hate these books. Uh, any of the general concepts books are basically a branching off point. They'll give you a lot of high-level details, and they tend not to cover the real issues that you run into in these systems and implementing them. That's why I think it's so valuable to actually implement them. And then you really see 
how nasty and how subtle some of these things can be. So uh, nice, I suppose, but definitely I would not recommend buying it unless you just desperately want to burn your money. Um, then you have Understanding the Linux Kernel, which as I mentioned, this is a great book, but it covers Linux Kernel 2.6, and we're way past that now. So um, again, if you really would like to learn this stuff, I would either rep uh, recommend this book or there's another book uh, whose name I can't remember right now, but just ping me if you're, you're curious. I'll be happy to look it up for you. I think the guy's last name is Love, and he... he uh, it's lower, it's lower detail than this book. That's why I like this one more, because it's like, we're Caltech. We should really understand all the details. So, um, But anyway, I think it's also a 2.6 kernel book. We don't have any. The kernel's been moving pretty quickly lately. So anyway, I would get this again if you're really interested. If you were only picking one, I'd pick that one, because it's like $40, and the other one's like almost $200. So, um, but yeah, everything that you need is really just included in the assignments or in the slides. Uh, let's see, yeah, so there's six assignments to complete in the term. Uh, this is the exact sequence of them. So what you'll do starting Wednesday when the assignment goes out is you'll write a simple shell. It seems to be sort of the classic um, project for systems programming. And I think it's a great warm-up because it'll remind you about C. It'll remind you about memory management. It may be challenging. I'm going to have you write something that's more challenging than what most people have to write. But hey, it's Caltech, right? So um, you get to learn how piping and redirection works. It's not that complicated once you figure it out. Okay. So um, And you'll also yearn for these days when you get to weeks two and subsequent. So um, second one, you'll write a bootloader. It's actually called a PC booter, computer game that you put in, or you would put in the drive if you had a floppy drive, and uh, boot it up, and the computer starts playing the game. It used to be very common back in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, which is why it's close to my heart. So you can do something simple for this. Uh, then these four are the Pintos assignments, and you can see each one of them takes two weeks. Okay, And they will give you a very complete exposure to um, basic operating system implementation details. You'll notice that the last assignment's due during finals week. Sorry, but that's just the way it's going to work out. Um, I don't know that I have much else to say about this. Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of time to tell you more things as we get through the term. Okay, and they are weighted. So the first two are worth half what the subsequent assignments are worth. So um, you can see like 10%, 10%, and then 20, 40, 60, 80. Okay. There's also opportunity for extra credit. Now, I don't think it's really possible to skip an assignment. Um, there certainly is if you're piffing the class, which I strongly encourage, unless you're doing this for uh, your CS major, and then makes me sad. I, I, would love, I would love if all classes were pass-fail, because I just think people relax and learn a lot more when they're just focused on learning and not uh, on their grades. But um, yeah, so there's opportunities in both of these first two to earn extra points. And then I think there's opportunities in the fifth assignment to earn extra points as well. And I think the sixth. Okay. So there's some options there. Any questions so far? All right, pretty easy. Uh, clab. So the assignments are hard. Um, I don't want to oversell this because if you tell people things are miserable, they'll feel miserable when you do it. And if you say, oh, they're not too bad, then they'll actually think they're not too bad. But um, they are hard. And um, the main issues I have listed here, lots of code to understand, and debugging actually turns out to be rather challenging. I was just thinking earlier today about how many times I heard students come to me and say, I wrestled with this bug for 10 hours. And I just threw away my code and rewrote it, and the bug went away, and I don't know what happened, but now it works. I'm like, oh, I don't want that to happen, but it may. So um, just be aware that these kinds of things, uh, systems programming is great. So uh, you are required to work in groups of two to three. Um, you are not allowed to do this course individually. Not that you're not capable of doing it. I've had students do this class individually back at the beginning when we taught it uh, for the very few, first few times. But what I noticed is that the people who took the class by themselves ran into um, a taller wall when they were trying to figure out bugs because they didn't have people to bounce ideas off of. And that's sort of the number one area where I think there's a huge benefit in working in teams in this class. Plus, it makes life a little bit easier, I suppose. 
Um, let's see, yeah, students can drop the class. I already talked about this in my, in my preview email, so um, just be aware of this. You can drop the class. It will affect others. Um, I say here, please only take the course if you really intend to finish it. Honestly, I don't care that much. Um, if you're like going to come in and say, hey, I want to take it pass fail, and I want to, uh, I don't know if I'm going to finish it. If it's too hard, then I may drop it. But you're with a team that also feels that way? Cool. That's fine. I don't care. Um, but you should make sure that if that's your attitude, that you <laughs> are upfront with the other people that you're working with. Okay. Um, I say here that if students drop later, we can adjust teams, and in general, that works out really well. I actually mentioned here that um, the student will have to learn the new team's code. It turns out that the, really the only assignment that is critical going forward is assignment three and four. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, the reason why is because five and six are built on those, but five is kind of standalone and six is kind of standalone. They also turn out to be rather hard. So if it turns out that around drop day somebody decides to drop, well, we can probably place a student and it probably won't be that miserable <coughs> for them. <laughs> no more miserable than it's already been, right? So um, we, should, we should be okay with that. All right. Um, that said, I would say over the last couple, three years, I have not seen many students change teams. So uh, this tends to be a rare event, especially if you plan ahead to avoid it. Okay, any questions? You don't have to have your teams today, but you should be getting your teams sorted out by Wednesday and Friday, I would say, is like your drop dead. Because it is possible to implement the command shell um, starting like the weekend and be, have it being done by uh, Thursday morning when it's due, Thursday 2 a.m. But um, you'd like to have more time. You really wouldn't, especially since there's like low-hanging fruit for extra credit and you'd like to take advantage of that. Okay, questions? All righty. Um, let's see, Git for managing repositories. So yes, I will create a repository on the CS cluster, and I will expose all of the source for the class. I will do it progressively um, so that you don't get distracted by a whole bunch of things that aren't really important right at the beginning. Um, I'll have instructions in the uh, assignment write-ups for how to grab that. At least one teammate has to have a CS cluster account that works to make that happen. Um, so you have two options, really. I can either make a repository for your team on the cluster, or you can create one on, you know, your repository hosting service of choice. Okay. So I mentioned GitHub and Bitbucket. Those are great options. I think there may be one or two others as well. And basically, the TAs have accounts. These, these imaginary TAs that I will have hired um, at some point, uh, have accounts on these, and I do as well, so it's pretty easy to share um, your repository access with those things. But I really strongly request that you make it private just so that um, nobody takes your hard work and cheats off of it or anything like that. Again, does this happen? Well, almost never, but it doesn't happen never, so um, let's just be a little bit careful about it. All right, yes, and then that's just where you push your code, and what happens is you submit a design doc on Moodle, and the design doc will have the commit hash, and then we'll pull the commit hash that you specify, and this is really nice because it allows you to do whatever you want to your repository. You can have nine branches and be working in all those nine branches. Just give us the hash, and we'll pull that one. Okay. Other side note, I haven't said anything about Moodle. That's because they haven't set up our course page yet because they think I'm teaching this next term. So uh, we'll need to um, get that done as soon as possible. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, probably talk about that Wednesday, because I imagine that's when uh, the Moodle will have been set up by then. So. Let's see. Submissions. Yeah, so collab policy, same as usual, but now on a per-team basis, you can't share implementation code between teams. With one caveat, I should be careful about this. <laughs> Um, sometimes you run into situations where there's bugs in Pintos' code or in an emulator or things like that. I don't mind if you share that code. But the code that's actually required for the um, assignment, you shouldn't be sharing that. Um, I mention that because there's one example where um, QEMU changed its software shutdown mechanism. The Box has this weird thing where you send the string shutdown to a particular port and then Box is like, oh, I should shut down. It goes, and... Um, QMU did that for a long time, and then they're like, this is actually really dumb. And so they stopped supporting it, and then people noticed that QMU tests were hanging. And so they just run them in box all the time. So um, if you share stuff like that, that's totally cool. 
I don't mind that a bit. We'll even talk about that on Piazza if it becomes necessary. But um, obviously, um, sharing code for the assignments is, is not allowed. Okay, let's see. What else? Set up and debugging. I can't tell you enough how important this is. I kind of run into this every year that there's one or two teams who, for whatever reason, just doggedly resist going through the debug setup process for Pintos. Okay? Obviously, not so important for assignment one. Assignment two, you'll be begging for a debugger. And I'll show you how to do it. It's um, pretty important. But... Um, it's really challenging to, to do systems programming, especially at this level, because you don't really have any tools to help you figure out what's going on. Emulators these days are really cool, though. And a lot of the emulators actually support connecting to them with GDB, and then you can watch your OS run instruction by instruction through the emulator. Very powerful. You should definitely take time to set that up and get familiar with it so that when you get to that point, you have that uh, facility to rely on. Okay. Um, we would run into a few teams who would resist that, and usually once we force them to go through that process and actually set up debugging support, their problems started magically becoming very understandable and easy to fix. So I just wanted to, um, I'm, I'm going to rant about that later too, I'm sure, but that's just a big thing. Make sure you go through the process of getting your debugging set up, and then your life will be so much easier. Okay. Yeah, Pintos has been around since 2004. There are solutions to these projects online. I'm just saying this as, you know, part of the rote. Um, I don't expect that people uh, necessarily uh, are going to, to just go and look for solutions. But, um, you know, the whole point is just make sure you take full advantage of the learning opportunity of the course. Okay, um, that said, if you want to um, wade through Linux kernel internals, go for it. If you want to wade through other things like, uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called, LWN dot whatever the, the um, top level domain is. Um, there's like, I think it's Linux Weekly News is what that stands for. But they have great articles about how kernels work and, and how various parts of Linux work. If you want to do that, go for it. Okay? I actually have a section in each design doc where you can cite external sources that you maybe drew information from or techniques or things like that. Feel free to include those in your citations. That's just great. I just want you to learn is really all I care about. So um, just don't, don't just copy code without trying to learn what it does. Okay, okay due date. So it'll specify its due date. Um, like I said, typically Thursdays at 2 a.m. <laughs> Usually I'm nice, and on the very last assignment, I'll give you more time. Uh, there's not a whole lot more time than Thursday at 2 a.m., uh, during finals week, but we'll uh, try to um, figure that out when we get there. Late policy, same as I always do, pretty much. Um, now, since we're operating at Teams, well, all of this applies at the team level. You'll notice uh, I'm pretty generous. You know, we only have six assignments, and I give more late tokens in this class than any other class. There's a reason. It's a hard class. So um, you have six late tokens. Don't burn them all at the very beginning. Um, you know, you're all very strategic people, I understand. Um, so just think things through. Um, but yeah, so 24 hours of extension, no questions asked, and you'll just say in your design doc. A lot of times what we see is zero tokens, zero tokens, and then they get to like the VM lab, and they're like, I used four tokens on this. And then on the file system lab, they'll use the rest. You know, that's not uncommon. So, um, because those are challenging. So, um, yeah, just be aware you have these late tokens. Also, when there are individuals on a team who run into issues, we have to sort that out somehow. Uh, I'll just make stuff up. So just come talk to me. Uh, you know, your whole team can come talk to me and, uh, or whatever, and we can figure out any kinds of extensions. Obviously, if, if an individual has a problem, well, that does affect the team, and then you have to figure out the team-level extension. So we'll get that sorted out. All right. Um, typical. Typical thing. Uh, any questions? Alrighty. Uh, yeah, so Pintos designed for Linux. I have seen people do this on OS X. Um, one of the very first years people actually got it working on OS X. They got a development environment in Xcode and all of that. And it was crazy the steps they had to go through to make it happen. Um, but then we started running into fun things like processor emulators running differently on different platforms. It's a real thing. Sucks. So um, what we do now is we say that everything has to run properly in 64-bit Mint Linux. 
I'll give you another uh, tip about this. I have also run into situations where students have come to me and they've said, we have this bug and we cannot solve it, but the bug is only occurring on one teammate's machine. If it works fine on other teammates' machines, just have us test it. It may actually work fine. There may be some weird thing about that one machine that's causing that failure. Okay? So again, welcome to systems programming. Uh, you should be really happy that we're not Microsoft, we're not Google, we're not Apple. We don't have to have something that works forever. Most of your assignments you'll get to throw in the bin after like a couple weeks. And that's really nice. So if you have weird situations like that, um, you know, do what is necessary to get to the goal. <laughs> Try to get to the goal and then move on, right? I mean, this is a class that's challenging, so you want to um, be strategic about things. If you have a situation where something fails on only one machine, just don't worry about it. You know? Okay, let's see. Yeah, I'll provide you a virtual machine. I'm going to start setting that up this week. The one nice thing about the first assignment is you don't actually have to write it into VM. I would definitely test it on 64-bit Linux to make sure you have all the APIs right because the system APIs between Macs and Linux are slightly different. Or if you do Windows and SIGWIN, they're slightly different. So just pay attention to that. But um, starting in, in week two, you'll definitely need to have uh, VM to develop in. And I'll make sure you get all that um, before the second week. Okay, let's see. One more note. Yes, you'll see me say this a lot. Unix this, Unix that. Or you'll see me say Starnix. Probably seen that before, right? So um, really we just mean all of the many variants. Um, <laughs> There's, there's a, uh, I'm not going to go down that, that uh, rabbit hole, I won't tell you about that. But um, there's a lot of different versions of Unix, and they all share the same characteristics. Okay? So just be aware that that's what we mean. Also, a lot of these concepts, they're everywhere. I try to make sure that in this class we cover everything you might encounter in a real, uh, you know, either commercial or, or practical in-use operating system. So um, it's just that we focus on Unix so much because it's so easy to look at how it works and experiment with it. Um, definitely talk about Windows a lot. Windows has some innovative stuff in it, but it's harder to look at the internals of Windows, so we kind of talk about it a lot. Okay, <coughs> any questions? Sweet. Okay, first question. What is an operating system? If I were to ask you, what does it provide? Why would I want an operating system? You can identify a couple of basic things that OSs provide that are kind of unique and special and have to be provided at this level. So ideas. What, what, think of something that an operating system provides that's really nice and helpful. Resource management. Resource management. That's a great one. Is that what yours? Yeah. Access to files, yeah, we're actually going to talk about that because of how crucially important it is and how difficult it is. People don't really think about it. Yes? Dynamic memory allocation. Dynamic memory management. It does provide that at some very fundamental level, but it's interesting because a lot of memory management actually occurs in user space libraries rather than at the operating system level itself. But there is an aspect of that. Yes? User input. User input is another good example. Okay, so you guys are thinking about facilities and, and capabilities and resource management. But what's another one? Addressing hardware implementation. Yeah, so that's in the same vein. Yes? Managing processes. Yeah, managing. What do we care about processes? Like, what naughty things can happen with processes if they, like, yeah. Race conditions. Race conditions tend to be within processes. So we, um, if they're in between processes, then the OS has bugs. We don't want that. CPU um, Yeah, we could have. So, what is that's a, a specific example of something more general. Yeah. Like concurrency and scheduling. Concurrency and scheduling, yes, is uh, still a specific example of something more general that I'm interested in. Yeah. But one process shouldn't be able to access another process. Yeah, that's all. That's getting uh, more specifically at what I'm looking for. We have issues of security in managing isolation between processes or um, how resources are managed and things like that. So we have abstraction, which many of you mentioned, the various abstractions that we'd like to have, and also how do we manage these shared resources among different, we won't say competing, 
you know, hopefully, you know, but they all definitely re reside in the same space. So we basically have to have some kind of standardized interface. And also, how do we manage the way that the shared resources are allocated amongst programs that want to use them? Okay? There's a ton of variations, but those are sort of the, the two basic things that you frequently see. Um, there's a really great analogy that I like in the Operating System Concepts book, which is that an OS is basically a government for your computer. The government by itself doesn't provide any real useful benefit. If it, if, the, if it was just all by itself, it would provide no useful benefit. But it provides an environment in which useful things can happen. That's what an OS does. The OS is like your, your computer's government. So let's start with the general purpose. And this is where I love uh, the mention of file systems, because that's actually the one that I, that I start with. Um, storage media. If you just look at your computer right now, you can probably imagine all different kinds of storage media that it's capable of interacting with. Maybe you have a solid state drive, maybe you have a magnetic hard disk, USB for flash drives, things like that. Maybe you, like me, have one of those uh, little you know, CD-ROM drives you can plug into your computer and, and access things on optical media. You could go on and on, right? So we have, even with hard disks, Okay, this is what's crazy to me. Um, but I've been around long enough that I've seen even more interfaces than this. Parallel ATA, very uncommon by now. Uh, most drives are actually serial ATA. They've got those weird like L-shaped uh, plugs on them. Then you have SCSI, which again is not so common anymore. I think there's another one called SAN now. I'd have to look. I mean, it's, it's uh, I should have probably gone and looked that up. Then you have USB disks. Okay, and that's just hard disks, right? Because you also have solid state drives, and solid state drives have a couple of different kinds of interfaces as well. One of the things that's annoying is that different size hard disks used to have to be accessed in different ways. It used to be that old, the olden day, like you know, when you were really young and probably just poking at computers, and I was wrestling with them and, and at Caltech and so forth, we would use this addressing mechanism called cylinder head sector addressing. I don't know if you remember in CS24, we discussed the physical structure of these devices, but you have a cylinder, which is all the tracks a certain distance from the spindle. Okay. And then you have which head on which platter you actually want to read or write. And then you have the sector, and that's the uh, you know, position, ang you know, the angle from a certain reference point the, that says when that sector starts and when it ends. Okay. So we used to access drives that way ran into size limitations very quickly. Not only that, but disks stopped having nice simple layouts. Okay? Because people noticed, well, you know, it's if you if you have like this little chunk of the platter, well, I can stuff more data on the outside of it than I can on the inside. So why not have more sectors along the outside than on the inside of the drive? And so this cylinder head sector thing broke down really quickly. And so a new mechanism was introduced called logical block addressing. Very nice. Let's make the drive think about all those stupid geometry issues. And we'll just deal with, give me a block number from 0 all the way to the end of the device. So block 0, block 1, block 2, and each one would be like a 4K block or a 512 byte block. Logical block addressing is so much simpler. Okay. Different kinds of devices require different maintenance. Again, maybe you haven't had to deal with this very much. I sure hope that that's the case. But it used to be on Windows, back in the day, first thing that you would always do when you were trying to figure out why your computer is so slow is you would defrag the hard disk. Okay? And the whole issue there is that seek, uh, seeks on a magnetic drive are expensive. It's the slowest thing a disk can do. And so you want large files to be stored in contiguous regions so that you can read them quickly. Okay? So you have to think about in your file system design, how do I lay out files? Do I need to do periodic maintenance? Thankfully, Linux OSs, or I should say Linux file systems, tend not to require periodic maintenance. Windows did, and so people would run the defragment, uh, defragmentation program rather frequently. Solid state drives changed all of that. Seeks are now constant time, regardless of where you're going on the drive. They don't care about fragmentation, but they do care about other things. Anybody know what they care about? 
Weird things like wear leveling. Maybe you've heard of wear leveling. Trim. Junk like that. This slow degradation of right performance that can occur. Oy. We'll talk about all that stuff. It all fundamentally comes down to the fact that these memory blocks can only be written to when they're empty. If they already have data, they can't be written to. They have to be erased. Further complicating this is that the erase blocks are much larger than the write blocks. It's like 512 bytes versus 2 megabytes, something like that. And the blocks can only be erased so many times, and then they wear out. Okay? So you have to think carefully about where you want to put data if you can get any read of how frequently that data changes. Okay? So this, this really uh, dictates how the OS interacts with the solid state drive. Okay? Then you have file system formats. Right, X2, 3, 4. I just sent up a, uh, a NAS at home so that we could get all the photos and all the media off of our laptops because they're running out of space. And that NAS was like when I was setting it up, that's network attached storage, by the way, just a box full of a bunch of disk drives. And uh, it's like, do you want to install better FS? I'm like, sure. So there's a whole bunch of new file systems that are uh, coming along as well. Many besides just these. These are the old school Unix uh, file systems. FAT32, any flash drive, you know, you want it to be FAT of some form or other so that you can plug it in different machines and it'll be able to read appropriately. Uh, you have various, oh, this is actually, ISO 9660 is no longer the um, most common CD-ROM format, but it is a common one. And then, of course, you have NTFS, which my Mac can read, um, so I can interact with Windows drives, HPFS for um, Macs, and so forth. Okay. So you see the list goes on and on. Would you want to write a program that has to think about all these details? No, your life would be miserable. You would quickly quit programming and go become like a Broadway dancer or who knows what. I mean, you would just say, this is terrible. Unix makes this simple. Open, close, read, write, LC. These kinds of operations are basically how you interact with all these disparate types of devices and files that are stored on these disparate devices. So the OS is providing this abstraction for you to use. Okay? And all of them are provided in this one abstract file system called the virtual file system. It starts with slash, and then various things can be mounted at various points. So you can have multiple drives, you can have different kinds of devices, and so forth. And they're all accessed through this very simple mechanism. Okay? Super easy. We'll talk a lot about this over the next uh, couple of lectures. The thing that's really cool about this, I think it's just awesome, is that other devices use the same interface. You want to talk over a socket. You want to write a web server. Well, you use read and write. Okay? You use close when you want to close a socket. The only real difference is you don't use open to open a socket. You use socket or accept. There's a few other operations as well. Um, Types between processes, you'll get to experiment with that in the first assignment. You say pipe, and you get out two files, basically. You write to one, and the data magically shows up on the other end. You write the other way, and it shows up on the other end. So, very simple. So you can see how the OS provides this abstraction. Okay, next question. Resource sharing. Again, the file system provides a great example of this. Here's the scenario. Process A opens a file. We don't really care what it is, so we call it foo. Later, process B comes along and deletes foo while A is still using it. What happens? OK, so here's the thing. There's a lot of answers to this question. Windows has an answer. Unix has an answer. You could write your own OS that has an answer. Um, but the bottom line is the OS has to make a decision about how these kinds of situations are supported so that programs know what they're dealing with. Okay. So this is an example of how the OS needs to govern resource sharing in some way. Okay. So the OS has to coordinate access between these shared resources. Okay. So um, just to give you an example, what Windows does. Process B comes along and tries to delete foo.txt while A is still using it. Does anybody know what Windows generally does? Uh, it throws an exception, tells you that the file is not 
Yeah, it doesn't throw an exception per se, but it will return an error status from the system call saying, sorry, somebody else is using that file. It's locked right now. So the delete fails. Does anybody know what Unix does? Do you have a guess? This is a very interesting uh, behavior. Yeah, your, your answer is almost correct. Um, you're very close to the right answer. Um, basically, the way that Unix handles this is that it differentiates between the directory entry for a file and the file's data on disk. Okay? So you have foo.txt, somewhere in the directory structure it says foo.txt points to this data. And then you have the data itself. When you delete the file, <coughs> Unix removes the path. So now it's no longer in the directory hierarchy. But the data is still on the disk. So process A can keep manipulating. Then when process A closes, the OS says, oh, nobody's accessing this data anymore, and it reclaims it. So more complex model. Possibly riskier. Windows is simpler. So again, it's a great illustration of how there are multiple answers to this question. It's not that one is right or one is wrong um, in this particular case, but the OS must specify how these situations are handled. Okay, questions? Yeah. Uh, what happens if like something happens, something bad happens to the kernel after, like between when B deletes the file and before A comes? Okay, so this is a very good question. What happens if the OS, let's say, explodes in some way between B deleting the directory entry and A finishing. So now you have the data living by itself. Well, now the file system is in a corrupted state unless the OS takes steps to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay? And you will have to wait for the exciting discussion in the file system lectures. Uh, there are mechanisms by which operating systems avoid corruption in these issues, in these, in these situations. They, they involve something called journaling. Okay? Any other questions? Alrighty, let's keep moving on. This is just a great illustration, but what we're going to do for the rest of this lecture is at least, yeah, for the next 15 minutes, I will try to describe to you how we got to where we are now from where we started. So this is a brief history of operating systems. Remember that early computers started out very large, very limited capability, and very expensive. <laughs> so we're actually jumping into the story a little bit further on than just the very first computers. But a lot of times you would have large companies or very well-off universities having one computer, and it was the mainframe. And if you wanted to use the mainframe, you took your program to the mainframe and left it there, and then let's say in six hours you came back and got the results of your program, and you really hoped it wasn't syntax error, at line, whatever, because then you have to try again. Very different way of interacting. Okay, so you'd have a job, and you can see that it would have like the compiler, and then the program to compile, and then the data for the program to run, and then the end. And this would be a stack of punch cards. I don't know how many of you have seen those punch cards, but a lot of times what people would do is they'd have the punch cards, they'd draw a line diagonally along one side of the punch cards with a marker, so that if they dropped or lost the punch cards, um, when they were putting them all back together, they could tell if they were in the right order. Fun things like that. So that was the day. So there would be a human being standing at one side of the giant mainframe with the stack of punch cards feeding through into the mainframe. So it would be fed in, the mainframe does the computations, and then the program outputs, and those are printed on a printer for the programmer to reference. Okay. When you see this design, again, thinking back in like the 60s and the 50s when this was going on, um, you spent a lot of time waiting. And it turns out so did the mainframe because it would have to read the stack of punch cards. Okay, so that's slow. It would spend a lot of time outputting to the printer. That's slow. And human beings are involved in this. Human beings are slow. So... If you think about mainframes from the standpoint, it's this large, expensive machine, and we're not using it for large chunks of time because it's doing I.O., well, maybe we can improve this design. Okay. And so, what happened is they started moving toward a batch processing model. You know what would be even better than a mainframe? is a mainframe plus a little computer that's not very good but knows how to take these punch card jobs and put them on a tape. 
Okay? And so what would happen is you'd have all your stacks of punch cards, and you'd write them onto a batch. It was a tape that you could then take the tape and put it on the mainframe. Okay? So the mainframe reads these jobs, executes them in sequence, just like before, and the output is also saved onto a tape. So what have we done? We've made it so our mainframe doesn't have to wait as long. <laughs> We're using it more now. And so if you think you've got this big expensive machine, I'm using it more now, so my dollars are uh, paying for more computations more efficiently. This is good, right? You could also have tapes for common things like the Fortran compiler, which thankfully we don't need anymore. But uh, you know, you would have common programs. Let's have system tapes so that you don't have to include that in the job anymore. Okay? And so at the end, you would take the output tape and put it again on another computer that could just print the output. So simple, special purpose, not as expensive. All right? So that's cool. We're getting more clever, but there's still kind of an issue here. Because like I say here, we read each job in sequence and we execute it. Okay? So if you have a job that's waiting on I.O., which started happening more and more because people said, ooh, this is really a useful tool. Why don't we give it a lot of data to crunch? Okay, well now we're reading it into memory. And that's taking time. Okay? So the CPU is sitting idle until the I.O. completes. And so basically people started designing multi-programming into these mainframes. Now you probably have never heard the term multi-programming before, but this is like the precursor to our modern multitasking support in modern operating systems. Okay, so if one job is blocked, let's switch execution to another job. That way we can keep our large expensive mainframe occupied and we can again maximize the uh, CPU computations per dollar that we are doing. So again, if the mainframe can keep multiple programs in memory, switch between them, then I can keep the mainframe busy most of the time. Okay? So you can see how all of this is like, wow, we got this big expensive piece of equipment. Let's try to figure out how to use it more efficiently. So now we start partitioning memory into regions for jobs. We have multiple programs. We are now running them. So we have mainframe memory. We're running three jobs right now. We also have an OS, nascent as it may be. Okay. And so we have to figure out how to set this up. What's the new problem we have to solve now? We talk about this a lot in CS24. Again, you may assume where it came from at that point, but now we're talking about it. Okay. If I have multiple programs that could be running at the same time in the computer's memory, then that means their data is there. They could interfere with each other. Do you have some, a comment along that line? Uh, yeah, they have to like, figure out how to uh, prevent them from like, uh, destroying jobs. Too. Yeah, or destroying data or even worse, stealing data. Because you know, you'd have a university with a mainframe, but they weren't using it all the time. And so you'd have a local company say, you know, could I um, take my sales data and do some number crunching on it? Or a bank, can I take my financial data and do some number crunching on it? Well, then you really want to make sure that the data is protected. So this became a serious issue. So we start having process isolation. Okay. And so this is where we started seeing the need for multiple CPU operating modes. And an OS as a trusted intermediary between these various jobs and the hardware and each other and so forth. Pretty cool stuff. I mean, I have a, a memory module from a Burroughs computer, which was, uh, I think it was a 1965 computer, but they actually um, were some of the first computers that were able to do virtual memory addressing back in the 60s. So that was before me, that was before you. Here's the other thing that started happening. People, like I said, would carry their punch cards, and they'd get their nice shiny printout saying, you had a syntax error. This sucks. Or you, I'm missing five lines of data that you were supposed to provide, but you didn't. Okay? So um, basically, it could take hours to even discover that there was a bug. Now it's so nice. I mean, in fact, you read uh, things online that talk about software engineering. They talk about trying to close the write, compile, test, debug loop, make it like continuous, you know, you talk about continuous integration or you talk about 
on continuous development, things like that. And they want to have that on the order of seconds. Well, it used to be hours and hours. Okay. So people said this is lame. So they started developing systems where you could actually share the mainframe between human beings at the same time. So that's called time sharing. And this is where you'd have a really lightweight terminal and it'd be connected to this big powerful mainframe. And as I say here, the mainframe is large and expensive. A single person will not keep the mainframe busy all the time. But a lot of people will happily keep the mainframe busy all the time. Okay? And so time sharing systems became uh, more and more common. Now what you'll notice is that it still was not a world where you had a computer in your office or even your department or lugging around multiple <coughs> computers as most of you do every day. Okay. So integrated circuits became smaller and smaller and more widespread and like I say here instead of an entire university or an entire company having a single mainframe uh, then they started going to mini computers where you might have five or ten of them at a company. Smaller and less powerful. And then, of course, we went to microcomputers so that you even had one's computers for individual users. Okay. Now, what was funny is that all the way up to this point, you basically had nerds taking care of these computers. And, you know, you'd have the operator sitting there taking your punch cards and putting them onto a tape and so forth. Okay. But now we start having people who don't care to learn about all the details of how the computer works. And so you start saying, oh, a graphical user interface would be very uh, helpful to abstract away all the details of how to operate these machines. Okay, so like I say here, graphical user interface. Again, if you want to um, really be amazed, then I would encourage you to look up the mother of all demos. You can find a recording of this on YouTube. Doug Engelbart, I think is his name. Back in the mid-60s, this guy came up with most of the uh, GUI mechanisms and capabilities that we have now, in including video conferencing between computers, shared document editing. I mean, it's not just like Google Drive and, and Office 360 and stuff like that. I mean, this has been around for a long time. It's just easier and easier to do it now. And in fact, easier to build it too. Okay, so again, things kept getting smaller and cheaper and faster. So now we start having multiple processors in a single computer. So you have multi-processor systems and multi-core systems. The distinction between those two is that a multi-core system has multiple processors on a single package. Very common now. Okay, we talk about this in CS24. You smush things together, they can talk faster because they have less distance. The speed of light is a thing, sadly, at this point. So um, the closer things can be together, the faster they'll go. Okay, multi-processor systems have multiple processors in separate packages on the same motherboard or maybe on uh, multiple daughter boards and they communicate to each other. Okay. This obviously complicates OS implementation. Pintos is single processor. You should be so happy. We're actually working on a replacement for Pintos because it's like 12 years old now. And uh, we're actually working on one implemented in Rust that's actually truly multi-core. And I can't wait to start using it, but it's still several years off because it's just complicated software to write. But anyway, um, obviously you have a lot of um, new challenges that start to emerge when you have an OS that has to manage shared data structures in a multiprocessor system. We'll talk about some of these in a couple of weeks. Okay, then you start talking about OSs inside of OSs. Okay, so I mean you'll be running your host OS virtual machine, emulator, Pintos. So you'll be four levels deep just doing assignment three. Okay? So very common. So you have a host operating system that runs a guest operating system as an application. Two common mechanisms. You have emulation, where basically you have different CPU types between the host and the guest. Okay? And then you have virtualization, where you have the same CPU type, and the guest OS actually has some level of access directly to the hardware. Okay? Depending on how far we go. Again, I want to spend some time talking about this in the future. It's always been an area that we haven't explored in this class. And I just really hope I can include it this year. Okay? Yeah, so the software that provides the virtual machine is called a hypervisor. You probably have, who's heard of hypervisors? Anybody want to guess when that term was coined? The 60s. So much happened in the 60s as far as computing is concerned. Okay, so hypervisor. 
And basically, it is kind of like the OS for other OSs, just like your OS is an OS for processes. Okay. So yeah, sometimes you have guest OSs that expect direct hardware access. Well, that's challenging to do, and so the hypervisor has to figure out how to manage that. Oh, I really hope we get to talk about that, because there's some interesting challenges that you have to deal with in those situations. Also, the guest OS may have strategies for caching, scheduling, that interfere with the host OS choices in those matters. Okay. So these are interesting challenges that have to be dealt with when you uh, have hosted operating systems. Okay. Uh, any questions on this? All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and skip forward through this. You can read about it later. Um, but the whole point is that OSs have different goals that they need to satisfy. If you have servers that don't care about user interfaces, then you can devote all your resources to I.O. or things like that. PCs or mobile devices have very different goals that they have to satisfy. But the one that I really wanted to talk about, um, yeah, so embedded computers, again, probably the most common kind of uh, operating system that you'll deal with is an embedded OS, whether you realize it or not. But the one that I really wanted to talk about is real-time OSs. Because we'll see this more than once. Um, basically, real-time OSs are all centered around the question of how do you complete a task by a particular deadline. Okay. Most of the time when we talk about real-time, we mean soft real-time. And that means that if I miss my deadline, the world is not ending. It's okay, just keep going. So it's not considered a system failure. Okay. So, yeah, your media playback gets choppy. I mean, all the time my YouTube playback just freezes. And I keep hearing the audio, but the video stops. It's like I get frustrated, but, you know, nothing exploded, right? So then you have OSs with hard real-time guarantees. What we mean by that is that the OS missing a deadline is actually considered fatal for the system. There are a few examples of this kind of thing, like anti-lock braking systems. You want your anti-lock braking system to hit every deadline. Otherwise, you go careening off the cliff, and it's very exciting, but you're not around to see it. So um, that's bad. Here's another example. Assembly lines. Okay? I have stuff on a conveyor. I have, like, a car frame. And I have the thing that comes and is supposed to put a weld at a particular place. If there's no car there, that's a failure. If the car is in the wrong place and I bust my robot arm, that's a failure. So you can see how... In these situations, the OS must hit every deadline. So that's what hard real-time is. We'll talk about some of the scheduling approaches for these things as we get into the class. Are there any questions at this point? Yes? Can, can you really do hard real-time guarantees? Yes, you can provide hard real-time guarantees if you're selective in what requests you satisfy. So you can have programs state their scheduling requirements and say no to some of them, and then you can guarantee that you'll hit your other scheduling requirements. Yeah, that's pretty much, I just gave away the punchline. You guys can skip that class. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, there's some really interesting algorithms. And, in fact, there was some really interesting work done at JPL that uh, affects that kind of stuff. Okay, next time we'll keep diving into this. We'll see you next time.